Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel mainly surrounding true crime and psychological cases as well as a little bit of university and lifestyle sprinkled in where I can. Now today I am back with another case and today we're going to be discussing the case of Betsy Ardsma who unfortunately was the very very unfortunate victim of a seemingly random but very brutal attack that led to her death and so if you want to hear about the details then keep on watching but as always the start of my videos I like to just include a little disclaimer just letting you guys know if you aren't aware of what I do and um, the videos that I make I am not trying to offend anyone by all means I'm not claiming to be an expert in any of these cases that I discuss I am simply piecing together information that I found myself on the internet so if I get anything wrong or miss anything out then I completely apologize I do not mean to offend anyone undo anyone an injustice and feel free to correct me in the comments below with all that being said if you want to hear about the case of Betsy Ardsma then keep on watching and we shall just get started Betsy Ardsma was born on July the 11th 1947 in Holland, Michigan, United States. Her parents Esther and Richard had four children over the years with Betsy being the second oldest child. When she was 18 years old Betsy began studying at the University of Michigan. She wanted to study English and art and she was really really good at what she did so she was very very passionate about her studies and was one of those sort of like naturally academic people and very very driven and this is how she will be remembered. Following her graduation at Michigan Uni, she decided to enrol herself in Pennsylvania State University in order to continue her academic studies. In the year 1969, 22-year-old Betty Ardsma was living for her academic studies in Pennsylvania State Uni. On November 28th of that year, she decided she would spend her entire afternoon evening in the campus library in order to finish some research that she needed to do for an English paper that she was working on. Betsy set herself up in the second floor of the library and quite a little secluded like area of the library. As you can imagine if you've ever been in a university library they are all quite large and there's a lot of little areas where you can kind of hide yourself away in a little corner and just get to work and this is where she was on the second floor of the library she just focused put her head down and got her work done. It is believed that on this day somewhere between 4 45 p.m and 4 55 p.m Betsy was brutally attacked inside the library. She was stabbed once with a knife in the left breast. The knife severed her pulmonary artery and entered the right ventricle of her heart, causing her to bleed out. According to the police investigators who looked into the attack, they believed that she was most likely unaware of her attacker as they had likely come behind her and put their arm around her in order to restrain her and stab her once in the left breast and ultimately just kind of left her there. She bore no defensive wounds whatsoever and so that led them to believe that she had no idea this attacker was coming for her. After being stabbed, Betsy fell straight to the ground and this was the position that she was found in when a student came across her body in the library. Investigators were able to determine that just a few minutes after her stabbing, there were either one or two men, there were conflicting sources, so some sources say one man, some sources say two men, uh, were leaving the library just a couple minutes after she was attacked through the central exit. But as they were leaving, one of the men leaned over to the desk clerk, kind of like at the reception area and just simply said somebody better help that girl and gestured towards where Betsy had been staying. And this was before anyone had been alerted of her condition, anyone had found her and so this was obviously the first person who had made them aware of Betsy being injured but they left very swiftly after saying this, they didn't say anything else and these, well this man slash these men are still unidentified to this day. A few innocent bystanders suddenly noticed Betsy on the floor and immediately rushed over to try and help her, see if there was anything they could do because at this point they didn't know what happened to her and obviously they didn't know what sort of condition she was in. Someone had decided to give her mouth to mouth in hopes of keeping her alive and conscious while they were waiting for the first responders to arrive in the library. Betsy was taken to the local hospital at around 5 p.m. which was when she was pronounced as officially dead. There have since been criticisms uh, towards the first responders uh, in terms of how quickly they took to respond to the call as well as how swiftly they got her to the hospital or not very swiftly they got her to the hospital um, and they didn't seem too panicked upon seeing Betsy. Now this can be explained by the fact that 
No one, like I said, had witnessed the attack at that time. So no one was really aware of what happened to her. Betsy's attack was very, very quick. And I guess in a sense, it was quite a clean wound. It only produced a very small amount of blood on her clothing or on her body. And in addition to this, she was also wearing a red dress that day. So many people have chosen to explain all of this, like these criticisms, by the fact that perhaps they just completely weren't aware that she had been stabbed at this point because at first look, there was no indication that she had been stabbed. From their perspective, all they had come across was this young girl who had slumped over in the library. And so immediately, I think their mind had gone to, she may ha maybe had a fit, maybe she'd passed out, she could have had a seizure. And so they were going to take her to the hospital as long as they kept her conscious and kept her breathing. Um, but then it was kind of upon examining her further on the way to the hospital or when they arrived in the hospital that they realised just what had happened to her and that she'd actually been stabbed and she'd pretty much died instantly. Betsy Arzma's murder still remains unsolved to this day with people still looking for any sort of explanation as to why she would have been the victim of this attack, whether it was a planned attack, you know, whether she'd been targeted and if this was the case, who was it? Like, who were these strange men that alerted the clerks in the reception area? But also, why would someone want to attack her when she just seemed like a lovely well-rounded university student. So what are the theories surrounding who could have potentially been the murderer of Betsy Ardsman? Betsy had been in a serious relationship with a fellow student, his name was David L. Wright and some sources even claim that her main reason or one of the main reasons that she wanted to enrol herself in Penn State University was because he was actually studying in the medical school there, um, he was pre-med student so they kind of had a reason to move into the uni together and ultimately ultimately live together and start their life together. And some sources even refer to them as being unofficially engaged because since her murder, uh, David has gone public on many occasions stating that he had been planning on proposing to her that Christmas after she was sadly killed. According to David, his last meeting or his last sighting of Betsy had been on the evening before her death. He'd been out for Thanksgiving dinner with his friends from his course when after it finished, he went and picked up Betsy and drove her to the bus depot because she had wanted to catch the bus onto campus so she could do a little bit more work, work on this English paper like she had been on the day of her murder and he had agreed to this because he needed to get quite a bit of work done himself so he would drive her to the bus depot and then drive himself home. David was obviously quite a high up person of interest in the investigation into who killed Betsy as you can imagine because in a lot of these cases the partner, the spouse, um, the other half is usually a huge person of interest. He was interrogated and interviewed thoroughly, but he was ultimately ruled as not a suspect whatsoever. He provided quite a solid alibi and everything seemed to add up. So he has pretty much been ruled out as having anything to do with it, but he as he is worth mentioning because he was one of the more prominent suspects in the early stages of the investigation. A one obvious point of discussion into discussing the potential suspects in relation to who could have killed Betsy was the one slash two men that were seen leaving the library with the mention of them speaking to the clerk about someone should go and help that girl. So obviously they are a huge person that should be considered. This behavior, like I said, seemed particularly unusual because no one else at the time had noticed Betsy. No one else had been alerted of her injuries. And so in this situation, you'd like to think that someone would have come across this injured girl in the library and would stick around to try and help her, would alert someone and then stick around, you know, to try and see what they can do. Um, maybe try and alert the clerk if that's what they've been intending to do in a more frantic manner and not just leave afterwards. But the way that this person slash people were seen, it just seems a bit strange that they kind of casually turned to the receptionist and said, oh, someone should go help that girl. And then they just left with no second thought to what had happened to her. Now it is entirely possible that this person was just maybe not the most gracious of people. Perhaps he was in a rush um, and was genuinely unaware that she was in a really, really uh, bad condition. And so had come across her, decided that he needed to leave the library, but he was going to alert someone on the way out perhaps. Now that is entirely possible. However, many people choose to believe that this is the case and that this person slash people were likely the source of the attack on Betty Ardsma. Now I'm going to kind of operate on the basis that there was just one man because a lot of the sources seem to say one man. There are conflicting sources but there was uh, most most witnesses I think said there was one man. Obviously there was mention of one man speaking to the clerk. There's also a sketch provided by witnesses at the scene piecing together a image of the face of the man who'd spoken to the clerk. Um, so I'll put that on the screen. They released it to the public obviously in hopes of someone coming forward and recognizing the man in hopes of identifying him but 
no such luck. And responders have actually been criticised very heavily in this case for the way that they failed to successfully secure the crime scene. So these, this man slash these men, unidentified man slash men, were able to just leave the library without anyone knowing who they were. A number of bystanders were able to just walk in and out. Obviously loads of people rushed over to help her. So it was a very contaminated crime scene and they couldn't get a lot from that. And so responders have been criticised very heavily for that, uh, allowing suspects to leave and allowing other bystanders, other innocent people to potentially ruin any uh, forensic evidence that might have been available at the scene. And in more recent years, a number of the authors and other individuals who've taken quite a strong interest into Betsy Ardsman's case have made their point to share their belief that a man, his name was Richard Hafner, uh, that they believe he had something to do and um, was most likely Betsy's murderer. Now, Richard had been a student at Penn State at the same time as Betsy. And so this automatically obviously places him in the area at the time. But not only this, he also lived in the same accommodation building and he was known at the time to have quite a lot of violent tendencies, we'll say, towards women. In more recent years as well, he has gained a bit of a reputation. He has been investigated on a number of counts of being quite aggressive and inappropriate towards young boys, as well as kind of just in general being given this reputation of a potential child molester. So not the most pleasant man. So one of the main theories involving Richard being involved in Betsy's case was a story that kind of goes along the lines of perhaps Betsy maybe met him on campus one day, perhaps they started dating in secret, or perhaps just as good friends and the pair spent a lot of time together. But then not long into their friendship slash relationship, Betsy told him that she didn't really want to see him anymore, or that she just stopped kind of hanging out with him, and that she told her family and friends that this was because she was becoming quite frightened of him, that he was showing sort of violent tendencies that she didn't feel comfortable with. And this theory goes that because of the rejection he faced at the hands of Betsy, he lashed out and attacked her. Hence why it was such a seemingly random attack, but also it was very swift. So it couldn't have been random because it was very quick and, um, I don't know, almost well planned out in a sense. And this idea is also supported by the fact that very, very shortly after Betsy's murder, Richard actually had a meeting with his academic supervisor on campus in which he was extremely kind of distraught about his friend's death, he told his supervisor. But at that time, Betsy's murder hadn't been reported to any news outlets, it hadn't been reported on campus. And so in all likelihood, people have kind of pieced these together as a link. This piece of information in particular, however, was not reported by his academic supervisor until seven years later. And the supervisor had reported it to another university official who then still continued to fail to report it to the police because I, I'm just assuming perhaps it maybe got lost or they didn't think it was anything relevant to the investigation. So nothing really came about there because it was all lost and all a bit jumbled really. And some people believe that Richard bore quite a strong resemblance to the sketch released of the unidentified man who had alerted the clerk of Betsy's condition in the library that day but nothing was ever confirmed. So his known association with Betsy as well as his short temper made him quite a high up suspect but only in more recent years when these kind of pieces of information have been pieced together. In 2002 however Richard Hafner died of a heart attack and so sadly there is no way of ever really getting any answers as to whether he was guilty of Betsy's murder or had any involvement whatsoever. Betsy's case remains unsolved to this day like I said and sadly um, Betsy's loved ones, family, friends are still looking for answers in hopes that someone perhaps somewhere would be able to come forward with any answers, maybe an identity of this unidentified man that was seen in the library that day or if they had anything that they didn't think was previously relevant. Um, it's so sad that after all these years still nothing has come about in the investigation. So that is everything I'm going to discuss today. Let me know your thoughts down below in relation to the theories that I've discussed or whether there is maybe another one that you've come about online and um, think could be likely. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you found this interesting and I will see you guys very soon for another video. Thanks for watching, bye!